Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Fiona DiDomenico, Regional President uh, with the Castle Group, and honored to be joined today uh, with uh, Tom uh, Jenks from Gunster. And I want to tell you a little bit about Castle before we get going, and then I'll hand it over to Tom and he can introduce himself and his firm. Um, but Castle is a Florida based company. And we specialize obviously in condominium and homeowner association management. The majority of our associations that we manage at Castle um, are associations where we can put a team on site. Uh, most of our associations are highly amenitized. So lots of gated communities. Uh, most of our communities would have, you know, um, highly amenitized. So clubhouses, you know, pools, gyms, uh, food and beverage um, facilities, et cetera, et cetera, docks, marinas, all of that kind of fun stuff. So we've got lots of experience in all those different areas. Um, and we have offices across the state. So we would love to um, help you out if you have any questions after uh, today's um, webinar that we weren't able to answer, feel free to reach out at info at castlegroup.com and we would be happy to follow up. So um, that's enough about us. We're going to have some fun today. We're going to we're going to walk through the uh, the new legislation. We're going to try to make it as interactive as possible. We do not want to put you to sleep, so stay awake with us. We're going to make it fun and uh, feel free, actually, as we go, to chat in your questions. And I'll try to keep an eye on those, and I'll uh, get those to Tom as we're going along. So, Tom, turning it over to you. Okay, thank you, Fiona. Uh, my name is Tom Jenks. I'm a shareholder with uh, the firm name is Gunster, Yokely and Stewart, although we go by Gunster. Um, Gunster is a statewide law firm. We've got offices spread throughout the state. Uh, it, it's a full service firm. We do um, all kinds of business related uh, state and probate community association uh, commercial litigation, uh, even immigration and things like that. Uh, I am in the Jacksonville office. Um, I have been practicing law in the Jacksonville area for about 40 years. Hard to believe. Um, I don't believe it, Tom. Not possible. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I have. And, and I, actually, I'm a third generation Jacksonville. And the That's fourth awesome. generation was born about 10 months ago. But uh, um in any event, and we're enjoying that. Um, all of the bills referenced in the, in the PowerPoint presentation are easily accessible via Google. You can, you know, for the first one, we're gonna talk about um, Senate Bill number 56. If you'll just Google Florida Senate Bill 56, uh, you'll be able to get to it pretty quickly. And the reason I say that is, I'm, I'm not going to put you to sleep by reading all these changes to you. Um, but nevertheless, to really understand what has happened, you need to read the actual language or have your lawyer read the actual language. Um, my goal today is just to alert folks as to what happened in the 2021 legislature and how things changed. Um, and, um, you know, so that you can go back and look at these things. And yes, and I'm, I'm perfectly willing to answer questions, um, you know, as, as they come up. Um, but some of them, <clears throat> the ones that require research, I'll probably have to pass on. Um, so yeah. anyway, and I'm glad I brought my little glass of water. <clears throat> yeah. And so, and Tom, I apologize. I forgot to mention, obviously you're not giving any legal advice today. That would be very specific. Um, we'll both do our best to answer questions. And then if we have to dive in deeper, we can reach out to you, you know, individually later yeah, that, uh, to follow up. That's right. The Florida rules of ethics preclude me from giving any actual legal advice on in, in a presentation like this. So Fiona, if, if, if you're good, we'll go ahead and start. Absolutely. Um, Let's go to the next slide. We'll dive right in. <coughs> next slide. There we go. Okay. 56. The, 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 there's really no rhyme or reason to why these things are grouped under specific Senate bills. It's the, it's the legislative process. So, but if you, if you, again, Google Senate Bill 56, you'll get, you'll get these sections. Um, the first one, 718, of course, applies to condominiums, 720 applies to homeowner associations, 
they made a few changes about the delivery of assessment invoices. Um, they specify, I think it's first class mail or email delivery, but if you, but if you change the method of delivery, um, you, you've got to get the unit owners to acknowledge it in writing. Uh, I hereby acknowledge that I'm going to now get my bill, my invoices by email. And that's one of the records that you have to keep as part of your official records. There's another section that prohibits uh, the association from requiring payment of attorney's fees unless you first give written notice of the late assessment amounts um, without attorney's fees. And I, I think you, you can't start hitting them for attorney's fees until 30 days after you um, give them that notice. And there's actually some statutory forms for these notices which I always encourage people, if, if the legislature prescribes a form, use it because the court's going to have a hard time saying anything wrong with it. Um, 720, actually, and I apologize, that should cite 720.3085, not 303. It, it's basically, as often happens, a mirror. Uh, so, so really, these changes um, are applicable to both condominium associations and homeowners associations. Uh, sometimes they, the legislature makes them mirror each other. Sometimes they don't. Uh, I guess that's why I have a job. Yeah. There's some job security there for, for, yeah. for you, Tom. But, well, and I would say on this one, you know, I, I've had some, um, some clients ask us about this. And, and for the most part, like this isn't dramatically different. I think most associations do send, you know, a letter uh, before sending anybody right to the attorney, that would kind of be best practice. The idea is not to send everybody to the attorney. No offense, Tom, right? I know you're on the same page. We, the idea is to get residents to pay, right? Timely um, and to educate them and make sure they know what the assessments are and, and when they are due. Um, I can tell you in all the years I've been doing this, I, I had um, one association say to me, you know, we, we just want to, you know, Everyone knows when their payments are due, we send them coupons. And then if they don't, you know, reply, we're going to send them right to the attorney. And that wouldn't have been our best practice, you know, to begin with. There's lots of things that can go wrong there. So nothing crazy, I don't think, in, in this one too dramatically different. No, nothing remotely exciting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Jumping to number uh, Senate Bill 72. Yeah. Uh, and so this one um it just really only has one section that kind of touches on uh, community associations and small businesses in general uh and it's and it specifies it, it's got it, it's got some detail to it but the upshot is you know if you make a good faith effort to substantially comply with governmental health standards like cdc pronouncements etc uh, it, your, your association is going to be protected from COVID-19 related claims. Um, and it also establishes a one year statute of limitations for COVID related claims. I can promise you there's going to be a lot of case law coming out about this. Um, so we'll see how it's interpreted. We don't have benefit for that now, but I know at the beginning of the pandemic, I had daily phone calls about what do we do about the clubhouse? What do we do about this? What do we do about our meetings? Uh, and, and the general rule was that most all lawyers were given was follow the CDC guidelines. If you've also got local governmental guidelines, follow those as well. Well, now we've got a statute that, that sort of, if you did that, you, you, you should be protected. Um, so, you know, I think this is, this is a good thing and it, it, it may stem the tide of, you know, what would other might, might be some, I'm hesitant to say frivolous, but that's what I mean. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, case, cases that are just out there. So hopefully, you know, I think it's a, it, it's a good balance. Um, if somebody totally ignored, uh, you know, CDC guidelines and whatnot, they're not going to be protected. I've always wondered exactly how you prove how you caught something, but that's for another day. <laughs> that's a whole other webinar in and of itself. Yes, because we've it all is. been discussing that one for sure. But yeah, I agree. This this has come up a lot, right, with COVID. And we had the exact same experience from a castle standpoint. We actually put together a whole playbook for our uh, boards and associations to follow. And 
you know, hindsight's 2020, right? It kind of seems like common sense, follow state, local, you know, guidelines, um, because it is different, right? We had to have those conversations with our associations where they'd say, well, you know, my sister owns a condo in Jacksonville and, you know, they're doing A, B, and C, and how come we're not doing that in Orlando, for example? And it could be that, the, you know, the counties had different, had different guidelines. Um, and the only other thing I'll say on that is I always, you know, tell our boards, guys, you're not the expert. You can't be the expert in everything. And so if you have, you know, the CDC saying do A, B, and C, you need to be careful if you're going to just completely disregard, uh, disregard that. And we always recommend, you know, let's discuss with your association's attorney uh, before we do something like that, because we want to keep everybody, you know, out of harm's way, because those lawsuits will come for sure. Yep. Okay, number 630. Okay, now Senate Bill 630 really contains the lion's share of the amendments that were made. A lot, there's, there's quite a bit to Senate Bill 630. Um, just sort of, all this stuff is basically in the order that it appears when you go through the bill. The first one is an amendment to the insurance statutes. It only applies to condominiums. Um, as you, you condo folks probably already know, the Condominium Act prescribes what the condos, what I'll call common element policy covers and what the unit owner's policies cover and ha has a lot of other requirements that are deemed to be included in these policies, whether they are or they aren't. Um, I am sure we've evolved to the point where the, the policies match the statute now. Uh, what this is about is if the condo's common element policy does not provide for subrogation rights against unit owners, the individual policies issued to the unit owners may, may not contain subrogation rights against the association. Um, very briefly, subrogation means if the condo's insurance carrier pays a claim and they believe that that claim was caused by a unit owner, they would have a right to subrogate against the unit owner or go back against the unit owner for such a claim. That's what subrogation is. Um, this says, uh, if it doesn't contain the right to do that, uh, then all the policies, the individual policies that issued to the unit owners will be deemed to have the, the, the not to have subrogation provisions. Um, that always gets a little tangled up, but uh, I, it, it's actually fairly simple when you read it. Um, 718.112. When they first put term limits in a few years ago, there was a lot of consternation about, you know, well, when, you know, what if, what if I'm, you know, if I've served seven years, you know, prior to the effective date of the statute, and there was a lot of stuff back and forth with the division. Uh, now they've clarified on, only board service occurring on and after July 1, 2018 will be counted towards the eight year term limit requirement. And that there was a lot of discussion on that when that came out. Oh my gosh, every almost every election I did, this this came up. So I'm glad that they, um, you know, clarified clarified that. I think you know better late than never, as they say, right? <laughs> well, and there was a lot of people in the know giving opposite answers. So I'm I'm glad right. to clean that up. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it increases uh, permissible transfer fees to 150 bucks and says that number can be increased um, by the consumer price index. Um, and on, on recalls, um, again, this is condominiums. It used to be the only way you could challenge a recall was to go through arbitration with the division. Now you, now you, the alternative is go straight to court. Um, so, so that's that. Um, seven, and on that, um, sorry, if I can mention on no, that, on the uh, transfer fees to 150, that's come up quite a bit with my clients in, again in condos because, um, you know, sometimes the expenses are high in a condo, right? If they've got, you know, uh, to reserve the elevator and they've got to do, you know, international background checks and all of those things can cost more. So I think that's part of where that uh, push was to get it up just a little bit higher to the 150, which I think is good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 718.113, again, condominiums. Uh, a few years ago, 
they added some language to the statute to accommodate electric vehicles, which are going to be here uh, before we know it. Um, and all this does is expand it to natural gas um, for uh, assuming they come up with a technology for nat natural gas. Um, the installation of these things um, are not material alterations that you got to get 75% of the unit owners to approve. Um, typically, I will tell you anything energy related or any kind of green initiative like this is going to get a lot of deference in the courts. And, you know, um, I don't advise associations who, who to, frankly, to oppose these installations. But I do draw the line at safety, and I, and I do think associations are entitled to require some kind of professional engineering or electrical contractor analysis or, or I guess, natural gas analysis to make sure, you know, what's being put in is safe. Yeah, that, that comes up a lot, um, especially with electric car charging stations is uh, not that the boards oppose them, but who's going to pay for the electricity, right, to charge. So if it's going into a common area, um, you know, quite a few of our associations have, you know, maybe taken four of the guest parking spaces or two of them and made them um, an amenity essentially that anybody can use, but then right. we have residents saying or owners saying, I want to have my own at my, in my own parking spot. And therefore, you know, in most cases that needs to be metered separately. Good, good point. Yeah. And, and there is in the existing statute about the requ requirement for metering. I mean, they're not, they're not sticking the association with the cost of these unless the association wants to provide it as an amenity. Right. Yeah. Um, 718 1255 is basically the dispute resolution statute in the Condo Act. Um, you know, originally what was required, I always call it the oxymoron, which is mandatory but non binding arbitration. Um, now, if, if the parties agree in writing prior to instituting a case, uh, the arbitration can be binding, and in, you know, which means you could take it to court and have it reduced to a judgment. And, and that's a very perfunctory thing. It's not a, not a new trial. It's just uh, confirming an arbitration award. Um, or you can stay with the non-binding arbitration um, or you can initiate uh, pre-suit mediation. This is a crossover to the Homeowners Act, which requires mandatory pre-suit mediation before you can go to court for certain disputes. So. I, again, it's, it's just a tweak on the existing law, not, not so much a big change. Um, uh, the next one is 718-1265 um, about emergency powers. Uh, this was relevant. I mean, originally this statute was enacted because of hurricanes. Um, this is the first amendment uh, with the pandemic experience. Uh, the changes are not earth shaking. You, you, you can read them yourself. It, it, it just makes it a little clearer that the, the pandemic is an emergency of the, of the variety uh, intended to be covered by the statute. Uh, at the beginning of this, there was a, a real argument about people were parsing the language and saying it really doesn't apply to a pandemic. It only applies to hurricanes and bad weather. I, I think they've cleaned that up. So yeah. that, yeah. that helps. Agreed. And, and, you know, for the most part, I have to say, you know, in our experience at Castle with the pandemic, we had very few, if any, that I can think of off the top of my head from a resident, you know, complaint standpoint where they said, oh, my gosh, the board, you know, didn't post this meeting with enough notice or anything like that. It was all everybody was very good about recognizing the board needed to meet in, in some cases, you know, early on during uh, COVID multiple times a day as new cases of COVID were reported, you know, to the management office, and we were trying to, you know, get information out to the community. So the boards were were rescheduling. We had, uh, you know, annual meetings and board meetings that need to be rescheduled on a dime. So there was all sorts of uh, things that needed to happen. So I'm I'm glad they clarified that uh, because as a board member, the last thing you need to be worried about is, you know, am I doing something I shouldn't be doing? It's nice to have it crystal clear that it's, you know, allowed. Absolutely. The, the, the next one is, is just sort of a, a little nitpick. Um, they wanted to clarify when fines are actually due. And as most folks know, 
fines are, are initially levied by a board and then they, then they go to an enforcement committee. And if the enforcement committee upholds the fine, then you give the, the folks notice of a fine. And this just clarifies that the fine is, is actually due five days after that notice is provided. So it clar cl just clarifies um, what the statute used to say. Um, the next one is 720.301. Um, I, I put a notation in there. It's significant. It is to me because when they when they included rules and regulations in the definition of governing documents, that impacts another section of the statute, which said uh, no amendment to the quote governing documents is effective until that amendment's been recorded. And typically. Or, or very often people were not recording rules. And, and then that begs the question, well, what about architectural review criteria? Well, what I regularly say is I think, I, I think it walks like a rule and it talks like a rule and therefore you should treat it as a rule. Um, and so for the past few years, I have advised associations when they amend either their rules or their architectural criteria, they need to record it. Well, now they've excluded rules from governing documents, so I don't, I don't think you have to record it. You can record them if you want to. Um, it's sort of going to be an association by association um, uh, situation. I know in enforcement, when you're in an enforcement mode, and if you find yourself in court or in front of an arbitrator, it's nice to say, hey, not only is everybody bound to, you know, as a member of the association, they're bound by these rules, but they're recording the public records. And when Mr. Smith bought his house, he was on record notice and all that. But the flip side is a lot of people amend their rules and criteria three times a year. And before you know it, you've got 50 versions of your rules in the public records. So you have to think, think about those things. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And, and that's, you know, in the perfect world, right, you wouldn't be uh, amending your rules constantly, but that's just not the reality. What we see is as boards change and as committees change, new ideas come in, which are good, um, but we're always very cautious for that exact reason and that you don't want to confuse your residents, right? It needs to be, let's not change it unless it really is a problem. Um, and, and Tom, if someone hadn't recorded their rules, and now they're no longer required to, uh, they don't need to go back and, and record. They're just, we're just moving forward at this point. I would, you know, we won't know for sure until a judge looks at that question or, you know, an appellate court. I, I would certainly feel like since we've had this window of time, you, you know, that, that um, if you didn't record your rules before July 1, you know, I, I would I would come down the side they're enforceable because of the way they've changed this law. But there's probably some ways you can take the chance out of it. Um, you know, perhaps you know re ratify the rules or something at a board at a notice board, board meeting. meeting or something mm -hmm. like that. I mean, it's a good idea. Definitely want to talk with your association attorney, but but I, I would think there's probably a fairly easy step you can take to ensure that because you didn't record them during that period of time, to make sure they're enforceable. Right. Okay, good. Um, 720.303, we're really getting into the not exciting stuff. Um, <laughs> official records, you know, include ballot signing sheet, voting proxies, and anything and everything else related to voting by parcel owners. And you've got to keep all those records for a year. Um, the next one talks about accessibility, you know, people that make record requests. Uh, records of guest visits to parcel owners are not accessible. Those are now kind of like attorney-client privilege stuff and personnel records and stuff that are not. Um, you, you know, and, and I'll tell you, this, this <laughs> more often than not, this, this comes up because some divorce lawyer gets his client who's a member of the association <laughs> to make a request to see who's been visiting the house. Right, um, right. What has Fiona Dinamitico been up to? <laughs> right, right. So, I, I mean, it's, it, um, I have lived through that one more times than I care to admit, but 
Yeah. That's funny because so that, I were I, chatting. I, we were chatting before this, and and I had said I had really had that one come across, you know, my desk yet. I, I've had it in like a a vandalism case where someone has said, "Hey, you know, my car was vandalized. Can you pull, you know, the gate records?" Um, but I didn't even think about the whole divorce thing. So, see, you have so much more fun, Tom, than I get to have. You get you get all the good cases. <laughs> I, I don't recall it being fun, but <laughs> anyway. Um, there's also some stuff in there about mandatory reserve requirements. It just sort of tightens up the language about when a homeowners association is obligated to fund um, reserves in accordance with the statutory formulas. Um, you know, you know, it's really just clarifying the existing statute, which was basically if it's in your documents, you have to uh, fund reserves, or if the developer prior to turnover funded reserves. Um, it, it, it clarifies all that. Um, there have also been for a number of years, some mandatory disclosures that need to appear on your financial reports and your budgets, uh, that if you don't have reserves, you're supposed to say X, Y, and Z. The, 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 the form of those disclosures is dictated by statute. So they modify those a little bit. Um, so make sure that if you're not funding reserves and you're obligated to put those disclosures, if you've got the current language, that all this became effective July 1. Um, and then there's some clarification. If, if you're obligated to fund reserves while the association is still under developer control, there's some clarification about what the developer's got to pay. Um, and then similar, the last one, similar to the Condo Act, uh, when you're dealing with board recalls, you now have the option of either going to court or initiating binding arbitration. Before it was just binding arbitration with the division. Now, now you can you have the option to go to court if you'd like. Okay. And Tom, just jumping back for an HOA, I think that's um, it's important for our listeners in an HOA, you know, budget season is here. Everyone's, you know, working on their 2022 budgets now. That does not roll off the tongue. I can't believe it's 2022. Um, so they need to have, they need to go look at this and need to have some kind of a disclosure if they're not collecting reserves in an HOA. Yeah, I mean, boards need to be aware of what their particular situation is. Are they in a mandatory reserve situation or is it still they don't have to fund reserves so they can fund some kind of unspecified contingency fund, which is, there's, there's nothing wrong with that provided the developer didn't make the decision for you. But if you are in that situation, there are some mandatory disclosures that you've got to put on your budget and your financial reports that put people on notice, no, we're not funding statutory reserves or, or mandatory reserves. So that's new for this year, for July. Yep. The, well, the clarification, the concepts. Not yes, good. yes, yeah, clarification. Good. Okay. Um, 720.305 is exactly the same as what I what I just said about condos. The the due date on fines is five days after notice is provided, and this is after the board action and the enforcement committee and all that. It's really another mirror provision. Um, 72306 specified that notice must be mailed to an owner at the mailing address appearing in the association's official records. I think that's a reversion to prior law. For a while, they had in the statute, you, know, you had to go to the property appraiser's website and get that address, which never made any sense to me. And mm -hmm. I think they've seen the light and they've gone back to, you know, there, there's a there needs to be a little responsibility for an owner to make sure that their mailing address is, is in the association's records. I um, always tell my clients, you know, it's, it's like you, if you have a credit card with whatever bank, it's not up to the bank to find out where you live so that they can send you the bill. It, it's up to you as the, you know, the, well, the owner to, to make sure. So, you know, you, you want your residents to have some kind of responsibility to make sure they they update their address. Yeah, and and the law for many many decades about real estate taxes has been you are you have the affirmative obligation to make sure the tax collector has your correct address. And the fact that you didn't get notice that your property was being sold on the courthouse steps does not matter. <laughs> exactly. So, 
Uh, That's another good analogy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad they, I'm glad they reverted back on that one. That makes more sense to me. Yeah. The, the next one is fairly significant. Um, it's basically a grandfathering provision for if you, if you amend your documents to put in some rental restrictions, um, those are only going to apply to people who acquire title after the date of the amendment or people who actually consent to the amendment. Hint, hint, when you do your amendment, you need to get people to sign, you need to get written consent. So you'll know what, you know, you'll know who consented and who didn't. Um, the, this doesn't require if the, if, uh, restrictions for less than six months, um, or prohibitions for more than three times a year. But, um, basically the reason for this was it frankly matches what they did with the condo act several years ago. It, it, it's a, it's a grandfathering provision. If you're, association is considering amending its documents to address rental restrictions, and that would include Airbnb and VRBO and all that good stuff. This is one where you really need to pull the statute out and read it carefully and, um, you know, make sure that you understand exactly how that's going to work. Um, the last one on this page is like, just as the case with board recalls, election disputes can now either go to binding arbitration or be filed in court. Um, and, it, you know, Tom, we, we always tell our clients, um, you know, sometimes the boards will say, you know, we don't, we don't want to spend any money. We're watching our budget, et cetera, et cetera. But guys, when you get to things like this, do not go it alone. At, you know, yes, read the statute, but you get with your management company, get with your association attorney, you know, do that 30 minute phone call just to make sure, you know, everything has been thought out because uh, it's money well spent up front than to try to unravel something, you know, two years later when you've put in rules that you thought applied to everybody and don't, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I like to say measure twice, cut once and, uh, you know, spend that investment. That's what your attorney is there for. Use your association attorney. Yeah, the, the, that's Amendments are really an area never to try to do yourself. It, it's, it's, there's just too many uh, ways to go wrong. Yeah. <clears throat> um, 723.07 deals with, it's the mandatory turnover statute. Um, it's got more detail than what I'm about to say, but it's basically the statute that says when a developer gets to 90% build out, that triggers turnover. Um, it really just kind of clarifies the language and talks about uh, how builders figure into that. A lot of times you'll have a developer who is the person named as developer in your covenants, but they sell lots to both individuals and builders. And it, it clarifies how builders count for term purposes of percentages that trigger turnover. It's, it's another one you, you, you probably, if you're interested, just need to go read the statute. Um, and then 723.16 is a, another one of these mirrors of the Condo Act where they broaden the emergency powers to make it, make it clear that, yes, the pandemic is an emergency. Right. And, and I always like to tell my clients on that one, um, that doesn't mean you can hold an emergency meeting, uh, you know, during the pandemic and approve those pickleball courts you've been wanting that you've had all sorts of, you know, uh, people voting against, right? It, ha it has to be uh, topic specific, emergency specific. So you can't go outside of the, you know, get everything you wanted approved, you know, all of a sudden. So um, do we have any questions from the audience? We were right on time. We're at 1235. We got, we got one. We you know, we oh, got one, one more. more. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. It was just one little tag, you know, uh, straggler. Um, yep. So this is a, not in the Condo Act or the Homer Act. This is the governor's uh, No COVID-19 Passports Act. So if you want to see, uh, you know, how, you know, you can't make people carry around a proof of vaccination in order to get on a ship and all that stuff. Um, although ships are a bad example because that's, they're fighting about that right now, but they're maybe, doing it. <laughs> maybe the, yeah, the theater is a better uh, example, but uh, uh, that's where that statute is. 
Yeah. And I have to say, knock on wood, I don't want to, I don't want to jinx myself, but again, for the most part, we have had great, um, you know, cooperation uh, across the state with the majority of our communities. You know, there's been some heated debates, but in most cases, people have agreed to disagree. And I, I commend, uh, you know, the boards, they've had a very tough, you know, year and a half and uh, navigating through all of the uh, COVID, um, you know, decisions that have had to have been made and it has not been easy. And uh, I, I think uh, hopefully we're through the worst of it and uh, on the other side now. And I think that in most of our associations, like I said, people have agreed to disagree and uh, you know, everyone's moving forward, which is, which is great. Let's see if we have any questions. I agree. I, I really feel like there've been very few, you know, pointed disputes. I mean, there's been differences of opinion, but for the most part, people have cooperated. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Good. We don't have any questions that have been chatted in. And I think that's, Tom, you have done such an excellent job articulating uh, what everything meant uh, with, with, uh, with ease. So thank you for that. Anything else, Tom, you wanted to mention? Well, there was a few questions we got ahead of time. Um, oh, yes. If you want me to address those, I'll be- Perfect. I'll yeah, if you best. have those, let's, let's do that. And I'll let you know if anything else comes in. Okay. Um, the first one is what prompted the change to elections? Uh, the site is the 720.306 subsection nine. I think this is one of those, you have the option to go to court now. Um, I, I don't know exactly what prompted. I know a lot of lawyers complain that the arbitration process has gotten slow, that the division's understaffed and it takes forever to get a, a, a case heard. Um, that would be just speculation on my part. And then it all, this question also cited 720.3116. I think it's a, a, a miscite. I, I'm guessing this has got to do with 720.306, 1H, 1 through 5. This is the grandfathering provision for leasing that we were just talking about. Um, and I, I, and I think the motivation for that was to bring it in line with the Condominium Act, which has had that. Um, just to digress for a second, in the case of the Condominium Act, there was a case called Woodside probably 12, 15 years ago that said, you know, if your documents say they can be amended on a two thirds vote, then they can be amended on a two thirds vote. And if that changes from a no leasing restriction to nothing less than a year, so be it, you were on notice that they could be, your documents could be uh, amended. The legislature didn't like that, um, at least in condominiums. So they came back and enacted legislation for grandfathering. Uh, and now this has gotten to the, the HOA side of things. And, and in all fairness, if it's applicable in condos, why wouldn't it be applicable for, for HOAs? And so mm -hmm. I think that- yeah. And we've seen it, um, you know, it's interesting. It's not as prevalent in HOAs because you do think of rentals, you know, being in, in condos more, but in our large scale as uh, HOA associations that are in, you know, um, you know, touristy more, you know, closer to the, to the coast, closer to the beach, for sure we see it. Um, and it's been an issue where we've had, you know, six bedroom homes that all of a sudden are being, you know, rented out constantly. And, and so, uh, it's some associations in an HOA that go, oh, it, it doesn't affect us, but not if you're on a on a coastline, it for sure it does. We definitely see it. The next one, can you please review aging condominium inspections slash certification requirements in the state? Um, that would probably be a little bit beyond my the scope of what I do. Uh, Really, the only thing in the condo, there's nothing in the in the Homeowner Association Act, but in the Condo Act, it's really tied to insurance renewals, and there's a requirement, I think it's every three years, that you have the building inspected, but that's more towards establishing replacement value and that kind of thing. Um, building inspection, I, I am sure there are some state codes, but I'm also sure there are a lot of local codes that have to be complied with, so the answer is... Uh, that probably varies from state to state. Having said that, 
I do know that the, the, uh, the committee of the Florida Bar that gets involved with legislation of this nature has appointed a quote, blue ribbon committee uh, to look at this in terms of the, the Surfside disaster. And um, you, you, this time next year, we may be talking about a lot of changes in a lot of a lot of places having to do with 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 inspections, but yeah, with um, that tragedy, and I, and I can tell you a um, couple of things. One, if you go to castlegroup.com backslash webinars, I believe that Craig Vaughn, one of our founders, or maybe it was James Donnelly, has done a webinar recently on this. So that question um, would be, you know, you could dive into that. Um, so again, castlegroup.com backslash webinars. And this webinar will be posted there as well. Uh, but all the webinars that we've done are there. And I think there's been a couple of them uh, regarding condos and inspections. To my knowledge, there are two counties in Florida that do require a 40 year certification. Um, and I agree with you, Tom. I think that, that those uh, that's probably going to get replicated uh, in more counties um, after what we've seen. Yeah. Um... How is the pandemic affecting legislation? Well, I think we've talked about that today. I mean, obviously the emergency powers have been broadened. Um, we've got uh, good a, a statute providing good defenses for folks that follow CDC guidelines and things like that. Um, and you know, you know the, the the no COVID nineteen passports legislation. I'm sure there's other stuff that's been done in response, but that's pretty much. You know, in, in the sphere of what we're talking about, that, that, that's that's yeah, what done. and I can tell you too. I think it's been eye-opening for uh, the lawmakers to recognize, you know, quite frankly, the the gravity of the decisions that board members have to make uh, on a daily basis in our homeowners and condominium associations across the state, and that it is a volunteer, you know, thankless position for the most part. Um, I sit on the board of CEOMC, which is all of the CEOs and the management companies across the state of Florida. And we advocate uh, in the legislature for um, you know, issues that are important to homeowners and condominium associations. And uh, I think the only you know, silver lining, if you can say that, is that it has made people aware of you know, the, the, it's not just deciding what color carpet goes in the hallways or you know, whether or not to approve a pickleball court, you know, the boards are making very uh, important, you know, um, decisions that affect people's lives on a daily basis. So I, I think that is one aspect that may be, a, you know, a positive. Okay. The next one, explain the new collection of assessment steps. Really, really the only thing that's new is the business about how you deliver assessment notices. And, and if you change it, you've got to get written consent from the owner. And then the requirement that you need to send them a late notice without attorney's fees and give them 30 days to pay before you can um, uh, include attorney's fees in the claim. Um, but, the, but the stuff we had before, which is a 45 day intent to lien and 45 day intent to foreclose have not been changed. So these are, they don't, they don't make it easier to collect. <laughs> that, that's for sure. Um, the next one is any change or, or clarifications to age balance regulations, paren 80-20 and 55 and up HOA communities. That is not state law. That's the Federal Fair Housing Act and it is administered by HUD and there are regulations in the code of federal regulations um, that if you want to restrict, um, you know, age, in other words, no kids, that, that you've got to comply. And there, there's a whole laundry list. The 80-20 reference is there's a supposed safe harbor that as long as um, you don't have more than 20% in violation of the age restriction, uh, you're okay. I, that's always something I, I urge age restricted communities not to rely on. They, they, you need to, the regulations require questionnaires and, and regular surveys and, and acknowledgements when people buy and acknowledgements when people rent and all that. Um, and then there is a, a registration with the state of Florida 
who administer some of the federal HUD guidelines and, and you need to be doing all that stuff. Um, but, but certainly nothing in the legislation we've talked about today changed any of that. Um, did the legislature adopt strict rules for reserve fund investments, only CDs, unless a professional advisor okays other assets? The answer is no. Um, the legislature has never dictated how you can invest your, your uh, uh, reserve funds. That gets into fiduciary duty and business judgment and, and all that kind of stuff. But, but no, there's nothing in the new legislation that did that. All, all there is, is as we discussed before, some new requirements for disclosure on your financial record, financial reports and budgets, and some clarification of, of when reserves are, are mandatory. Um, can the next one is can a community association charge a percentage late fee plus a fixed dollar amount late fee? That's nothing new. Um, the answer is they can charge a late fee of the greater of $25 or 5% of the payment that's due. So it'd be like $25 a month or 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 five percent, whichever is greater, and you can charge whatever interest rate is authorized by your documents. Um, it's two different. One's a late fee, one's one's interest, and, and and but that's like I said, that's not new. That's that's what's always been the case. Um, the next one is what has changed. I hope I've explained what has changed. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> I hope everybody's got a better idea of what they've done this year. Um, prospects for new legislation. I mentioned the Blue Ribbon Committee and building inspections and all that. I think there'll be a lot of activity around that. An annual debate is whether the Marketable Record Title Act ought to apply to covenants restrictions in homeowners associations. It's a non-issue with condos. I won't get into that right now, but, but with homeowners associations, it's kind of a gotcha. Oh, oh, by the way, your covenants are gone unless you go through a miserable procedure with the Department of Economic Opportunity. Um, I, for one, hope someday the legislation will create an exemption for covenants restrictions or an exemption for covenants restrictions that are administ administered by an active association. Uh, the title industry has lobbied ferociously against any such exemption because it lessens their exposure for old covenants. Mm -hmm. um, that's my little soapbox, but that's one I'd like to see uh, get changed. And the last one is, do mortgages have a vote regarding rental restrictions? Uh, they don't have a statutory vote, but they may well be, you have to look at your individual documents. It may say, you know, lenders have the following rights and in that list may be to vote for amendments uh any amendments or amendments affecting rentals or or whatever it's a, there is a document um review process there there are there are some statutes not this year but in the past five years that create you have to just read them about if you send a lender uh a request to participate in voting on something there's time limits after which it's presumed they waived the right and voted in favor. Um, so you have to look at that. Um, but as far as them having a statutory right to vote on rental restrictions, the answer is no. That's all the questions I got. Good stuff. And let me just make one last check. I think we've got them all, Tom, but let me just confirm here real quick. Yeah, no open questions. So uh, with that, Tom, thank you so much for being so generous today with your time. You're really, welcome. really, really appreciate it. Okay. And uh, for all of our uh, board members that decided to join us today, thank you for your time. We hope that that was helpful. And as Tom said, we, you know, he gave you an overview. Uh, you know, Google away if you have more questions and certainly feel free to reach out uh, to Tom um, at his firm. His, his information there is on the screen at Gunster or um, reach out to us at Castle Group and we'll get you to Tom. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you again on our next webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye.